fourth session of Irish History from the Hedgerow at the Irish Roots Cafe, produced by irishroots.com, with Peter Riley Adams and Michael O'Laughlin. Find a spot on the warm, sunny side of the Hedgerow now. Today's session is about to begin. They were rough, unpolished men, brilliant scholars, teaching by the side of the road, in small rooms, in nooks and crannies, wherever and whenever possible. Such men as these, they were the teachers of the hedge. When I was a gossoon of eight years or so, with me turf and me primer, to school or to school I did go. I I went to a schoolhouse without any floor. I Welcome to another session of the Irish Head School. Peter, why don't you let all of us know what we've got in store today? Well, what we're going to look at today is the Williamite Wars in Ireland, um, the battle between, or as it's been known as, the, the, the War of the Two Kings. Um, James II, of course, by this time, was the King of England, but James had Oh, he had something that the English weren't too happy with. It was called Catholicism. James, who had been the son of Charles I of England, remember old Charles, lost his head under Cromwell. So this is the period after Cromwell. Cromwell's son became Lord Protector, but it was a great disappointment. And they thought, well, we need to have the restoration of the monarchy. So they did bring Charles II back. Charles was Protestant, but then he died, and the natural heir, the legitimate heir, was James II, and he was Catholic. Well, they weren't too thrilled with that, and uh, uh, James uh, started to uh, redo the issuing of uh, Catholicism in England and, of course, in Ireland. And the Irish were looking very forward to this uh, and thought that would be a wonderful thing, but the Parliament... Remember the old battle between Cromwell and the throne, the parliament and the throne said, who was in charge? The parliament. So as the parliament, when James started to uh, make things more Catholic, many members of the parliament said they didn't want that. They would prefer that they remained a Protestant nation, considering other things that were happening in Europe. Uh, There were Catholic nations and Protestant nations, and which side did anybody want to be on? And so they, the English then decided to invite uh, a fellow who was the sovereign prince of Orange. He was governed as a stadtholder uh, in Holland, Zealand, Urk, Gilders, and uh, Overjessel of the Dutch Republic. And the theories, of course, as well, how can they let that Dutchman in here into England? Well, go back in William's history, William happened to be the grandson of Charles I, who lost his head under Cromwell. His uh, mother was uh, Mary, the princess of England, but she, of course, went off and married uh, into the Dutch uh, thrones. So here's William. He actually is English on his mother's side, related to the throne. He is the nephew of James II, and he's also the son-in-law of James II because he married his first cousin, James's daughter, Mary. The name Mary seems to, it's in, in so many, uh, you know, you have Mary I, and there was Bloody Mary, and there was Mary, Queen of Scots, and there was, a, who, by the way, was William's mother, and a grandmother, rather, because of Charles. And so you have Mary continually flowing through. And so it gives us a, an idea of who Uh, was actually coming in to do this, but the real problem with this war was we want to maintain the Protestant growth in England and the Protestant control of England, and so James, who was the king, legitimate king, and in London, but was not uh, accepted as well by the Parliament, so the Parliament invited William to come to the throne. Well, and you know, uh, um, I was just going to make the point to some of the specifics there that when James came to the throne... 
he had a very good plan. All of a sudden, the army started to become more Catholic, more Catholic. and the officers, the Protestant officers, were being replaced by Catholics. Like Catholic minutes, that's right. That's right. That's so right. pretty soon, the army was majority Catholic, which would have made the Protestants a little fearful, to say the least, because they know that the Irish want some of their land back. And uh, you'll see the nobles, when they're coming before James in court, if you were a Catholic, you were much more likely to get your request granted or to be uh, uh, decided in your favor. So that was another reason that made things sort of iffy. And at that time, James actually granted free home worship to Catholics, but he didn't grant it to the Presbyterians, which even makes it a, a, a more complicated matter. Well, the, you know, in all of the religion stuff, the, England wanted to have the established church, which is the Anglican church, which in American side or other places, and it's the Episcopalian church. And so they wanted that as the established church. So not only did uh, the, the Protestant group uh, persecute the Catholics, they also persecuted the Presbyterians. And the Presbyterians are also, majority at the time, were Scotland. That's where much of it started. And, of course, they came down to England. England didn't want that. They wanted their church. Uh, the church and the state were one. And so you have this then this problem of religion. And then when James comes in, he says, well, wait, we have to go back to, uh, to the Catholic idea. And remember, even when Henry uh, was changing everything, he never changed the, the prayers and the rituals. He, he just changed who was in charge of the church. Speaking of the uh, Scots-Irish, we talked about that in the episode on immigration, and those Scotch-Irish Presbyterians, that's really uh, where the term Scots-Irish came from in America to di to discern the difference between a native Irishman whose family had been there for hundreds of years as opposed to the Scots-Irish Presbyterians who had settled in Ireland and, mo and moved on to America. Absolutely. And, and again, we, we'll find so many connecting things, you know. Uh, but when we go to the Williamite Wars then, uh, part of that is a direct consequence of the glorious revolution. Uh, James, Roman Catholic, introducing freedom of religion for Catholics and bypassed the parliament. Things sound awful uh, reminiscent of times past. It was an unpleasant reminder in England of Charles I, who had the conflict with parliament and that ended in the Civil War. Uh, the breaking point in James' relationship with the English political, uh, the whole push of the parliament, and then came in the, oh, about 1688, when his wife, his second wife, by the way, gave birth to a son. See, his first daughter was Mary, and she had uh, taken the Protestant faith. But in his, now uh, James has another wife, and uh, his, uh, he's, he's going to bring them in to be Catholic. And this fear led some and it, you know, it says, well, they conspired. Uh, I, I don't really see it as a conspiracy as such to ask William to come and be that. He was James's son-in-law. Not only, of course, was he uh, the son-in-law of James and the nephew of James, he also had a grandparent who was the king of France. You have the intertwining of, of, of the royal houses. They're all together. Uh, and at the time, of course, the Dutch, where William was, were at war with France. So who's going to be on whose side here? Who are we going to be? And uh, Charles II and James had fostered a close reliance with France uh, since the Restoration. And William uh, wanted to uh, detach England's resources of men and money and arms from France and put that at his disposal. So William, in 1688, invaded England, and James fled after putting up a token resistance. So then we move to when you were talking about the army uh, and how many of the Catholics, here's where we're coming to the battles. And where's the battle going to take place? Well, the Williamite Wars, and for our emphasis, we're looking at what happened in Ireland. That's right. And that brings us right up to really uh, the biggest battle so far that we've come to in this, this period, and that would be the Battle of the Boyne, which was uh, William of Orange against the Jacobites. And of course, some people might say Jacobites. Who in the world is that? And what does that refer to when people well, say Jacobites? That's from James because they're using the Latin. Oh, so, and the Jacobites yes. are the Catholics who were supporters of James II, who was the Catholic king, a restoration of the Catholic king. Now, remember, we have Henry who leaves the church, and uh, 
His son, Edward, uh, just for a very short time, there decides, well, we'll keep this Protestant tradition. Then Edward dies, and the next heir to the throne is Mary, who was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, but she's Catholic. So she tries to restore, and she marries uh, Philip in Spain, and the Vatican actually had him as listed as the king of Ireland, but he didn't want that, and he didn't spend much time there, so he's gone. And uh, so then after Mary dies, and she doesn't have an heir... Elizabeth takes the throne and pushes the Protestant uh, idea all the way and even to Ireland and when we have some of the plantation uh, things occurring in Ireland. So Ireland has uh, Protestants who have been planted there in a sense. That's a funny word saying they're planted, but how you make plantations. And they go to Ireland, and so they have now become Irish in a sense. It's their land too because we're talking a number of years later and then there's again the whole discussion. Charles is beheaded by Cromwell. Cromwell is viciously against the Irish, really because they supported uh, Charles in the war against the Parliament. And so Cromwell wanted to do that. We saw what he did in our last episode. And now we're moving on to uh, still a battle between a restoration of the Catholic throne or a maintenance of the Protestant throne. And, of course, James is still in... Uh uh, France at this point, and he's, with his cousins. Yes, that's right. It's a family matter, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And you know, you can get the ferry from uh, Ireland over to France. Yeah, it, it, nothing to it, nothing to it. So it's very close in terms of landmass. I mean, uh, so they're related. There's an, a great interrelationship with these people. Well, and one of the things I see when I'm looking at this, there's always a little mention of that. The main reason the French, when they helped the Irish, or the Spanish, when they helped the Irish, they wanted to prolong the war to keep the English troops in that country and to keep uh, uh, England weaker on the continent or in America. So their whole purpose was not to go in there and win the war for the Irish immediately. It was actually to string it out. So you'll find them maybe holding back and uh, defending the troops when they were retreating so the army wouldn't be destroyed and they could live to fight another day. But many times they don't actually enter the main fray of the battle. Oh, absolutely. Uh, And again, why fight in your own land when you can fight on someone else's? Uh, Let's uh, and keep them separated. You know, there was some army uh, in France who were supportive of James. There's army in Ireland supportive of James. They're split. Let's keep them apart from each other. Now, an interesting thing is that uh, Louis the Fourteenth, uh, who becomes king, he's a great rival of William of Orange. They're cousins, but he can't stand them. And it's because who's really going to assume the power? We're not only looking at battles in Ireland and England, we're also looking for who is the dominant power in Europe. What, the yes, and where is James going to return to when he comes to Ireland? Where, where was a safe place for him to dock and to bring his soldiers in that uh, he might avoid conflict initially? And, well, they picked that very well-known port, uh, something we ran into at the beginning of this century, uh-huh. uh, Kinsale. Went to Kinsale, which, which was, it is a safe port in a sense. Uh, and from there you have a, a point where you can take off into various parts of the country. It's in Lower Cork, and yet you can go up on both sides of the country and uh, support yourself and defend yourself from any other thing that's coming at you. And he brought French support with him. They were behind him. They were going to try to keep this going, and uh, you saw them defending the, the troops in many places, and then the Boyne, and then you'll see later on. Then they decide to leave, most of them, and... Uh, Some of those decisions are very curious. Why were they here in the first place, and why did they leave in the middle of the fight or after the tide turned? Uh, It's very interesting to look at and to try to determine what was really going on. But this is the first time the king actually came to Ireland in 300 years, so that would have been an additional rallying point for the Irish. You know, he opened the parliament in uh, Ireland, and uh, an interesting little tidbit of the, the crown he wore as king, was made in Ireland. So James II opens the parliament, uh, hoping that the Irish parliament can then not make decisions, rather, by itself and not have to do what the English parliament says. And that, again, is another point of contention between the throne and the parliamentary system. 
And as we look at this battle starting to shape up, I don't know what number you've seen, uh, Peter, for the troops, but they all say that uh, William of Orange had more men badly outnumbered the Jacobites or the men of James II. Uh, I've seen the number like 36,000 men or more for William, and that included English, Irish, Dutch, Danish, German, and French Huguenot uh, portions of the army, and a lot of those were very well armed. The Irish, on the other hand, they say James had a force of about 25,000 lesser armed men and uh, not as well trained, that's to be sure. But James did have the advantage of picking out just where that battle was going to happen. I saw also that there was about 36 uh, with William uh, at the Boyne. Uh, And there had been about 20,000 troops had been in Ireland since uh, 1689. But the Jacobites, or James, they were about 23,000, 23,500 maybe. And and he did have French. Now, the Huguenots, they're Protestants too. So you do have elements. But some Catholics did fight with William. Yes. So you've got who's with the army and who. They were trying to survive themselves. You know, what, what was I being offered? Uh, in order to survive. Yes, I'll fight, and who's going to win? And it's always, you, sometimes, sometimes you pick both sides. Can you imagine that right after a big battle against your enemy, uh, if you would say, okay, now, if any of you soldiers want to come over and join me, come on in. Well, you know, it, it's almost like it's a game on a chessboard. If you had just been spending your, the what energy you had to, to eliminate this person from the face of the earth in battle, why would you join them the next day? And you see that happen. And even, uh, even after uh, Limerick, you saw, I think, one whole uh, troop of horse went over to William. And, of course, those were the old English settlers for the most part, I think. And I, I think that uh, as they saw how things were going, you know, these weren't established armies all the time. A lot of, in, in Ireland especially, there were peasant people yes. who came up. You know, they didn't have the uniforms. and that. They had their pikes and they had their guns if they had guns and their weapons that they could use. And they were really into survival. You know, you talk about uh, where did William come in? You know, James comes in in Kinsale, so that's way south in Cork. And William, he lands in Ulster in Carrickfergus, <clears throat> which reminds me of a thing, of, and I'm sure you've heard of it. I wish that I was in Carrickfergus only for nights in Ballygrand. Carrick Fergus, a, a great town and a port city, you know, and that's uh, that's what you want because they were going to come south. And Ulster, he had support in Ulster. William did because of the other things that had happened. The Scots Irish were right they there. Were there. That when I was talking earlier about the plantation, you know, they had all gone to Ulster, and Ulster is the closest. Actually, you can be at some points in Ulster uh, and look, and on a nice day, you can see Scotland. It's right there. And you know, I took a little look at the. Uh, the warfare techniques of that day. And you might wonder, well, as this battle was shaping up, what kind of equipment did they have? And I'd read where some of uh, William's men would rejoice because they said they saw some of the Irish and they had pikes. Pikes was, were really outdated by then. The bayonet had come in and, uh, most of them were the bayonets where you couldn't fire the gun. You had to apply the bayonet to the gun after you had shot it and then use it, uh, 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 to defend yourself with, but that those were old fashioned, and the Irish had those, and the other people really didn't. Uh, you, they, the Irish just had a lot more pikers than them. Uh, the Danish, they had no pikes at all; they were well armed. Uh, the English had six guns for every piker. The Irish had maybe three guns per every piker. So even though the the odds were against the Irish, it was even worse than it looked on paper because it's sort of like going up against a machine gun when all you have is a rifle. Uh, It wasn't quite uh, right. And you look, uh, the flintlock was the newest weapon, and the matchlock, uh, the older form, was really what uh, most of James' troops had to use. So there again, you're at a disadvantage. And the grenadier was a new... uh, really a new form of battle. They used little small balls that were filled with gunpowder, and they carried them in a pouch. And they now had, for the first time, uh, grenadiers on small horses. They were really infantry. They would ride to the place of the battle, dismount, and then fight, and they'd use those grenades, hurl those grenades in the course of the battle. Uh, It was sort of a new technique that they used. And, Peter, you mentioned those uniforms uh, both sides preferred to use the red coat that was mm. the symbol of the armory of the King of England yes. because they were both claiming the throne. Uh, and it was sort of funny because one brigade that had left to go to uh, 
France fought for France wearing the red uniform of the King of England, which was uh, might have confused some of their enemies. Well, you know, there's an old story about uh, the red coats. Uh, and, of course, we're familiar in the United States uh, from our uh, revolution and the red coats, and we, we talk about them. Who is it? The red coats are coming. The red coats are coming. You know, there's sometimes very practical things here. Why were the coats red? Well, was it red because it's the royal color? Yes, and if you look at the of the Union Jack and you see the red, white, and blue and the crosses and some are meaning uh, each of the provinces are from England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland all being put in there into the flag to talk about the United Kingdom. But red was a practical color. They wore it because if you got shot, you couldn't see the blood. And it was very disheartening when they saw their comrades bleeding. So they were wearing red, and you couldn't see. It, it, it absorbed it, yet it wasn't as noticeable. If you were wearing a, a, a lighter color or even a darker, you could see the red, and therefore you saw the blood, you could also become fearful. So, and, and that can be a, a true or not, but there, it, it certainly makes sense. Well, yeah, I think that's sense. probably part of the mix of why. The other thing, red is a striking color. It's a bold color, and uh, it might help strike a little fear into your enemy if they see you coming. You're coming in full strength. That's right. And you know, I was also reading back then, they came in on uh, tracks of the army. There really weren't roads for them to follow. Uh, most of these things, they make their own tracks in the country, and a lot of the bridges, half of them had to be followed down, and you'd have to... Uh, wade across the river, maybe knee deep, and then walk up the bridge that had fallen, that half had fallen into the stream. And uh, so it was, and a lot of bogs, so uh, travel was not an enjoyable thing for the Army. And also the, in, in that period, a historical period, people chose places to go fight. You know, today, unfortunately, the, uh, it, a battle is everywhere and anywhere, but there was battlefields. Now, many of them, of course, didn't. When you went to destroy a land, you went and destroyed everything, burned it and uh, killed everybody in sight. But the traditional one, the gentlemanly thing, if it would be, was you went to the battlefield, you then, what time will the battle start? Seen some of that even back in the Cromwellian times against Charles I. They wondered, what time will the battle start? Well, okay, well, 9 o'clock. Oh, good, then we can have breakfast and we can... And then came the battle. Yes. So it was kind of an interesting uh, approach to warfare. Uh, and for, you know, uh, they went, of course, to, to the Boyne, about 30 miles from Dublin, and uh, there, there's an interesting thing about the dates. And you, you, you mentioned uh, also the Battle of Ogram. Uh, and then we have the Battle of the Boyne, which is the one that everybody is uh, the most familiar with. And uh, in um, Northern Ireland, we have the, the group known as the Orangemen. Well, they're making themselves that they are supporters or are traditionally carrying on the ideas of William of Orange, the Orange men. There's the Orange Order, which becomes a Protestant uh, order. But the Battle of the Boyne was actually fought on July the 1st. Well, it's remembered on July the 12th. Well, the Battle of Ogram took place on July the 12th. But a little thing happened in the middle as we on on when did something happen. In 1752, the British and their possessions at the time accepted the new calendar, which had been established in 1582, by, known as the Gregorian calendar, by Pope Gregory XIII. And so it was to bring things into line. We went from the Julian calendar to the to the Gregorian, but the English didn't take it then for, you know, 160 years, uh, 260 years, I suppose. And so July the 12th in the old style was the Battle of Agram. In the new style, it was the 23rd of July. And in the old style, the Battle of the Boyne was July the 1st, but in the new style, it was July the 12th. So you have a very strange thing. Both battles, which were so important, wound up actually, depending on which calendar you're looking at, on the same day, 
even though it's not actually the same day, but the, the number of the day. Well, that's right. And if you look at old documents, then you're going to see a 12-day discrepancy in anything written before the time the English adopted it, uh, written by them at least. Right. And it's known as the short year when it was done because they took 11 days out. Now, how could they do that? Well, they were coordinating it with the sun. You know, they wanted things to be more accurate. Uh, how many days are there in a year? What's the distance between... Uh, uh, what's the distance, not between, but the distance uh, it takes for the earth to go around the sun and how many days we have in the month and how many. So, And that's why today we, we still have a leap year. It's to kind of coordinate the days. Uh, and the old calendar didn't have them all. They, they had it misinterpreted and they actually had days left over. So they were trying to put them in. So they had to eliminate in order to bring a universal calendar and everybody could abide by. Hey, you know, as you're, we're coming up here to the Boyne, uh, one of the big personalities you see fighting there, and I just start reading his name, that was Patrick Sarsfield, and he was in charge of one regiment of cavalry, and we'll hear more from him before uh, this little episode's over. Patrick Sarsfield. Yes. You know, there's also another interesting thing, uh, and for those times, and, uh, and Sarsfield, a limerick man, often people think that, and, and though today I do think it's true, but in the past, in the, in the 1800s and such, the name Patrick, people, their sons, a lot of people were named Patrick. It was always assumed they were named after St. Patrick, but there's other, other stories and other legends saying, I was actually named after Patrick Sarsfield, who was the one who held out and waited for the battle. Of course, eventually he left, but it was because he was such a hero for them in that particular time to name your child after somebody who defended Ireland so admirably uh, that we should remember him, along with, of course, Patrick being the saint. And But I think that moved actually to us when saints' names became extremely popular. Yes, that's right. And we're going to see he made some daring raids, and he did some things that uh, most Irish were defensive and uh, just tried to figure out how to hold out against these bigger forces. But you'll see Sarsfield did some very daring things and had some victories that really, really flew to uh, inspire the Irish, uh, particularly there as they got closer to Limerick. And there's a story about him uh, attacking a convoy that was coming up from Cork with some very important material uh, for the Williamite army. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit now. But uh, what do you think about the Battle of the Boyne, Peter? Do you want to cover anything uh, of the actual battle or uh, just move on? We'll move on. I, I do think, though, that uh, it's very interesting to me that the Battle of the Boyne uh, is the one that is most readily remembered by people. Oh, yes, and I've been there by the Boyne and near the Hill of Tara, and oh, the Battle of the Boyne, that's when, when Ireland lost. But the real thing is it was the kings were there. Yes. And they, they, they both left. William left too. His armies and other of his, uh, his leaders went off to do other things in Ireland in the continuation of the Williamite Wars. But James left. Uh, first he went to Dublin, and, and then he actually kind of escaped and went back to France to save himself. But that battle at the Boyne was between the kings. And I think that's why it's so significant. And that's why even though the other battle happened on the 12th of July, everybody says it was the Battle of the Boyne that happened on the 12th of July. So I think it's because it was the two kings, because one king represented the Catholic side, the other king represented the Protestant side, even though they were relatives, it was a matter of what they were about to do with the English throne and the English parliament. And I think that's why the battle historically becomes an important idea. Well, and the symbolism goes back for centuries. You know, we talked in our session about Brian Baru and the, and the Vikings. Well, that was a battle at Clontarf, and it was really to... Uh, uh, hush the main Viking force there that was in Dublin and to, to quell that uh, center of uh, and power and sort of conquer it, so to speak. And then just a few uh, decades earlier at Rathmines, that was very important, and that was for control of Dublin, and that turned the tide of war uh, uh, during the, uh, the Cromwellian and the Confederation. So this is just a continuation of the battle for that uh, really big medal, that big prize. And uh, I might... Uh, the casualty figures in the Battle of the Boyne. Uh, they say that there was approximately, if you take the, the amount of the Jacobites and the amount of the Williamites, it's about 50,000 people. 
and about 2,000 died, and three-quarters of them were the Jacobites. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, it did not all happen at the Boyne. There were counterattacks by the, of the cavalry, and a lot of the Irishmen deserted. And the, William, the Williamites uh, marched into Dublin, and Jacobites abandoned the city, marched to Limerick, and it was over. And, of course, the French uh, uh, barrack, uh, uh, took care of guarding the rear as the Irish did retreat, and uh, they almost got fired on by the Irish themselves. There was a lot of confusion in battle. And our next episode, we're going to go on and... Uh, our next session to talk about the Battle of Limerick and I'll mention at least uh, the Bridge of Athlone. What was that about? And why did they name that dance after that? And Ogram and a little bit about the Treaty of Limerick. So uh, we've got plenty more to go on. We've run a little longer this week, but I'm sure you'll uh, you'll come back for next week's session and we can sort of in a minor way wrap up the uh, 1600s in Ireland. Uh, so until then, uh, keep the hedge growing, Peter. Keep it going, keep learning, and uh, I'll give a little quiz. Uh, we didn't say it because I wouldn't say it on the on the air, but old James of uh, James the Second, he had a nickname, and uh, look it up and see what you can find on James the Second's nickname after.